Please welcome Scott and Cooper. Thank you very much. Cooper and I appreciate the warm welcome. Let's start with just a real quick piece of trivia. Anybody know who was the first Confederate general under arms to enter Pennsylvania? Anybody know? Aha, his name was Jeb Stewart. Why was he in Pennsylvania? Cumberland Valley Railroad. One other quick question. Anybody know what George Pickett was doing on July 1st while the Battle of Gettysburg starts? Uh, we're going to learn about that tonight as well. The answer is Cumberland Valley Railroad. Cooper and I want to talk about this railroad in particular because most people have never heard of it at all. And yet the Cumberland Valley Railroad, by the time we're finished tonight, you will understand this was the single most targeted tracks, the single most targeted railroad in all of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania during the entire Civil War. It is the only railroad in Pennsylvania the Confederates attacked three consecutive years. So let's take a quick look here. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Cumberland Valley, in a quick nutshell, it's the northern extension of the Shenandoah Valley. So if you cross the Potomac River uh, and head through Maryland into Pennsylvania, the valley becomes known as the Cumberland Valley. It's part of the Great Appalachian Valley, which lasts uh, from way down in Alabama, goes all the way up to Canada. To give you an idea of the importance of this area, it's an incredibly fertile area. It has a lot of tremendous natural resources. Uh, first white settlers arrive, uh, French fur trappers, in 1720. Within 30 years, there's enough people that live in the Cumberland Valley they can start carving out a formal county with organization, with towns, things like that. It doesn't take long before there's so many people that they carve up the county into two and you end up with Cumberland County and Franklin County, Pennsylvania. This area is tremendous for natural resources. It's bisected at its southern point in Hagerstown, Maryland by the National Road, today known as US Route 40 or Old Route 40 in places. The National Road ran from Baltimore into the wilderness, uh, into the Ohio country. Just to the north of that, halfway up the valley, the place called Chambersburg was the US Route 30, of course, most of us as Gettysburg bus are familiar with that as the Cash Town or Chambersburg Pike. But in reality, that was the Pennsylvania Turnpike that ran from Philadelphia all the way west to Pittsburgh. And farther north, up in Harrisburg, you had other routes that went west over the mountains heading towards Pittsburgh as well. So the Cumberland Valley has always been an area of intense interest to the commerce of Pennsylvania. Uh, and early on, they want to connect all these wagon routes which have huge amounts of Conestoga wagons and other brands, Studebakers, et cetera, that are heading west and east across uh, those three highways, <coughs> trading with the Pittsburgh and far, far places farther west. So if we look here, this is the Cumberland Valley where it's located. This is Pennsylvania's canal system. It was meant to tie New York, uh, upstate New York into Maryland and also over here, Philadelphia, of course, right here. Uh, in Pittsburgh, of course, over here. So the idea of tapping into the Cumberland Valley to match the system of canals and uh, railroads, et cetera, gets a lot of traction early on in the Pennsylvania legislature. They end up trying to pass uh, bills that would authorize uh, the creation of a new railroad to connect to the Pennsylvania mainline canal system. They never get the money. Uh, so the system kind of dies. We're going to enter this guy. Anybody here fans of the Pennsylvania State University? This guy is the father of Penn State, as we'll learn later. Uh, he's the head of the Pennsylvania Agricultural Society for many of his uh, years of his life. After the Civil War, he advocates the location of the Pennsylvania Teachers College uh, up in Center County. And that, of course, becomes the Pennsylvania State University. Well, his name is Judge Frederick Watts. In 1831, He's part of a group of businessmen in Carlisle that want to get this railroad built. Uh, now, early on, they're going to try to want to build this railroad from Carlisle North uh, up to the West Shore uh, area, uh, particularly what a town now known as Camp Hill. But they want to get this railroad going. He has surveyors look at uh, lines. They have some possibilities. Everything looks to be pretty good. But they're going to meet with the governor, and the governor tells them, you must share 1,500 shares of stock. 
because you basically have, a, have enough seed money to get a railroad created before we're going to give you permission to actually start the railroad. Now, Carlisle in 1831 is a pretty small place. There's not <coughs> enough money to get 1,500 shares of stock sold, so this is unsuccessful. It never happens. Well, the Watts doesn't give up. He goes back and decides to really start spreading his wings. He comes to Philadelphia and starts tapping into Philadelphia's financier community and looks for significant amounts of capital. He also decides that this railroad really shouldn't start in Carlisle. It should start in Chambersburg. And oh, by the way, it should also connect all the way down to Hagerstown, uh, Maryland. So he starts pushing for a, a bigger railroad with more and more involvement from southern Pennsylvania. And as you'll see, he's successful. I'm going to raise $642,000 in just mere weeks. This happens to be a, a, one of the very first stock certificates. That's actually the printer's proof uh, that belongs to a friend of mine in Chambersburg named Mike Marat, uh, who graciously allowed Cooper and I to use this for our book. But it gives you an idea that you know they're, they're raising massive amounts of capital. $642,000 in the mid-1830s is a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, uh, but back then it's certainly an absolute fortune. Uh, so they recharter, they bring in this guy named Tom McCullough. McCullough is, has Philadelphia connections. He is a War of 1812 veteran, pretty widely known in the Commonwealth in those days. They pay him an astronomical salary of $1,500 a year and make him president of the new railroad. So we got a charter. We got a president. We don't have much else. So we need to start building a route. So they hire this guy, his name's William Milner Roberts, who's one of the leading, uh, in fact, he's Philadelphia-based for a lot of his career. He's one of the leading designers of railroads in the Mid-Atlantic region, in New Jersey, New York, uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, places like that. Later, he goes out west, and he's heavily involved in the westward expansion. And in fact, his papers are in Bozeman, Montana. But this is the original route that he proposes from Camp Hill now then known as White Hill, through Mechanicsburg, Carlisle, down to Shippensburg, Scotland, and Chambersburg. Well, the little tiny village in Newville, Pennsylvania, decide we need the railroad to run through us. And they go door to door, and they collect $2,500 from the local citizens of this small village, and basically bribe the railroad and say, look, we'll pay you for the extra route. Please run your railroad through our town. And so the final route of the Cumberland Valley is going to go through Newville, a longer route than the carlisle Shippensburg route. So the railroad's in pretty good shape. Now the Philadelphians who are financing the whole thing pick a Philadelphia general contractor, a guy named Joseph Snowden. He uh, hires a lot of workers in the Harrisburg area, many of which are Irish, uh, and they end up starting to build this railroad. Now they learn real quickly $642,000 can go like that when you start building the actual railroad itself. You have to acquire property, you've got to excavate, you've got to do massive amounts of surveying, you've got to move earth, uh, you've got to bridge rivers and creeks and build culverts and build an infrastructure. And so the railroad starts getting into trouble almost immediately because uh, they want to do 52 miles. Now they actually are smart, they're going to want to make this wide enough to double track, but they'll never put the second tracks in, at least until after the Civil War. They do buy their first three locomotives. They buy them from Philadelphia, in fact. Uh, that point in American history, William Rogers uh, in Philadelphia was one of the three leading uh, builders of pioneer railroads, uh, locomotives. And so they order these three locomotives that are not to exceed $6,800 in expense. Uh, and so they got, they got locomotives coming, they got a route. Uh, so what they got to do next is raise more capital. Uh, now, the Panic of 1837 hits, and a lot of American businesses start issuing what become colloquially known later as shin plasters. Uh, they issue promissory notes. Uh, in the case of the Cumberland Valley Railroad, they promise you that we're going to give you, look at this, 6% interest over one year. Anybody here CD pay 6% over one year? This is a pretty good amount of money. Uh, and the railroad tells people, just invest in us, buy this note, and I will pay you 6%. Well, all across America during the Panic of 1837, people were doing the same thing. They were issuing all of these stock promissory notes. It turns out most of them are worthless because the companies go under. And according to popular legend, 
they become known as shin plasters because the only thing these stock certificates are good for is to put a poultice on them, wrap them around your shin after a mule or horse kicks you, uh, and they're only good as shin plasters. So that's the popular legend is where the name comes from because most of these things are totally worthless. Not the Cumberland Valley's shin plasters, oh no. These guys pay them off within a year and they do pay you the 6%. Then they raise more capital. And now with the money, later that year, they build the railroad. Now look at this. This is Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, remember, the, you guys ever heard the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks? There are no wrong side of the tracks in the Cumberland Valley because they're going through downtown. And look on the left. You got the churches. You got these businesses. You got these beautiful uh, businesses here on the right. And this is run down High Street, which is the main drag in town, uh, at least one of the main drags in Carlisle. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the Cumberland Valley's attitude, is we're going to park this railroad right downtown where everybody can see our trains constantly, and they can just simply walk out of their houses and get on the train. Uh, so they're going to have, uh, up in Bridgeport, now called Lemoyne, they put their uh, railroad uh, facilities up there, engine repairs and things like that. Then they build a small stop in Mechanicsburg. But they use Chambersburg as their headquarters. They will eventually, before the war, erect 21 separate buildings in Chambersburg. So you're going to have corporate offices there. Uh, well, this is a weird railroad because corporate offices are in Chambersburg. The president of the railroad, uh, at, when he becomes the president, Judge Watts, is in Carlisle. And the chief financial officer's office is in Philadelphia. So it's an odd arrangement. <laughs> as it turns out, it's going to work uh, for one simple reason as we go forward. So they bring on the locomotives. They're going to make one test run. Now, I love this railroad. As far as Cooper and I can tell from all of our research into this, they make one test run, and then they run the most passengers of any train in Pennsylvania history. One run in August. And they say, we're ready to roll. They bring in the second locomotive from Philadelphia. They put 500 people on a train. 500 people had not been done that I can find anywhere in Pennsylvania history at that point in time. They include Thaddeus Stevens on this train. They've got a lot of notables on this train, and it gets publicity for the Cumberland Valley all over the area. So, and they have this giant party in downtown Chambersburg when the things arrive. Whoops, go the wrong way, there we go. So look at this. Do any of you guys use Amazon Prime? Raise your hands. These guys were long before Amazon. They had this interesting promise. Look at this. First day of business, February uh, 1st, 1838. Leave Chambersburg at 4 o'clock in the morning, arrive at Harrisburg at 8, Lancaster at noon, Philadelphia at 6 p.m. Same day delivery, long before Amazon. Uh, so they'll get you your product. In fact, Philadelphia hotels will advertise fresh beef from the Cumberland Valley. How fresh is it? They killed the cow overnight, put the cow on ice, and sent it to Philadelphia. By 6 p.m., it's being unloaded and being butchered for the time for the 7 and 8 o'clock dining in downtown Philadelphia. That's fresh beef. And again, you're doing this with a railroad, uh, which has never been done before in Pennsylvania history that we can find at this point in time. Uh, so the railroad's doing really well, and they start thriving on innovation. They have the fastest trains, at least at that point in time. They've got this you know, overnight delivery uh, guaranteed to uh, Philadelphia. And then they start bringing in people from the West on stagecoach from Pittsburgh. They arrive in Chambersburg, and they decide we're going to put these folks on dedicated sleeper cars, the first sleeper cars that we can find that are ever developed in the United States. Uh, the car's called the Chambersburg. Look at these booths. Now, as I told Cooper earlier, I took my six grandkids down to see Mickey and Donald this year, and we rode Amtrak overnight. I will guarantee you this 1838 railroad was more comfortable than Amtrak. Yes. Uh, yes. We had a long, painful night on the way to Florida. But this is dedicated. There's a lot of discussion on how comfortable this is. And also, by the way, this is a male-only car. And somebody will also talk about the noises that are coming out of that car all through the night snoring and other kinds of noises that are coming from the car as well. Uh, so they finally decide we're going to bridge the river because uh, we got to get into downtown Harrisburg. So they build this wonderful railroad bridge. It's 4,000 feet long, so it's about you know 
almost 80% of a mile going across there. Uh, huge thing. And look at where they run the trains on top of the bridge. You know, I can just imagine these poor people as this train is creaking across this bridge uh, and they're looking down wondering how many train cars have we lost this month uh, into the muddy Susquehanna. Luckily, as far as I can tell, they never lose a single train into the river. That's kind of a relief. But these locomotives prove too heavy for the bridge. And so they will start using horsepower to draw the cars across the bridge. Well, uh, Watts takes over permanently in 1841 as the railroad's official president. He will oversee this amazing period of expansion. Throughout the 1840s and 50s, they're making a ton of money. They will finally run the railroad all the way down into Hagerstown. This, you'll see again, the downtown Hagerstown. This happens to be Walnut Street. Uh, that's the Catholic Church. Uh, but they've connected. So now for the first time in history, you can jump on a train and run through the entire Cumberland Valley. But as you can see throughout all these towns, this is the railroad tracks. This is downtown Greencastle. Boy, that splits the middle of your town. You know, there are, again, no left or right on this, uh, no right or wrong side of the tracks. Uh, and down here, you got the spur of this industry that's going to be involved in the Civil War in uh, manufacturing goods for the Union Army. So there's the final route, starting in Harrisburg, crossing that bridge, White Hill, Carlisle, Shippensburg, Chambersburg, Marion, Greencastle and Hagerstown. One of my hobbies that I've turned into books is writing about the three railroads that ran between Maryland and Pennsylvania during the Civil War. Uh, the first and the oldest was the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore. Of course, left from across the river here, went all the way down to Baltimore. The second ran from Baltimore to Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania, and then on up to Elmira, New York during the war. That was the Northern Central, and then going farther west, is the Cumberland Valley. Those are the three railroads that crossed the Mason-Dixon line during the Civil War. But look at the problems. This railroad has been making money. They're going to start losing money because that bridge burns down. They actually rebuild the bridge. They have it almost to the point of operation, and a massive flood wipes it out again. So they got to go back in and rebuild for the you know a second time to get this bridge up and running. And they start building these wonderful locomotives. This is the Jenny Lynn. Anybody ever seen this, this engine? The Pioneer, I mean? This, lo uh, this locomotive is owned by the Smithsonian Institution. It's on permanent loan right now to the Baltimore and Ohio Museum in downtown Baltimore. So if you've ever been to the B&O Museum, you've seen this locomotive. This is one of the three oldest locomotives in Pennsylvania, and we don't have it. It's in Maryland, uh, but that's OK. Uh, at least for the time being. So this little thing, they end up building this small little locomotive in South Boston, and they're going to use this lightweight thing to haul the trains across the river, uh, displacing the horsepower, because this is a far more efficient way of getting things across it. Burn this little image in your mind, the utility. Cooper's going to touch on the significance of this train in a few minutes. This train will be involved in one of the more shall we say, sadder instances of the Civil War. Uh, and in 1855, they build this thing. Now, look at that. Now, one of the things the Cumberland Valley wants to do is again be an innovator. So they build the first combination car in Pennsylvania where you and your baggage are guaranteed to arrive on the same vehicle. Before that, there was this problem on railroads, particularly the Pennsylvania Railroad, that uh, at times the baggage cars would get separated from the passenger cars, and your bags would be in Pittsburgh and you'd be in Philadelphia. And the Cumberland Valley is like, we're not going to do that. Uh, so they put you on the back of the train, and as you get off, you grab your own bags and walk off, uh, much like, obviously, an airplane or something today. Uh, so by 1959, the railroad has taken over operational control of the Franklin Railroad. Uh, so the Cumberland Valley technically now operates the entire line from Hagerstown up to uh, Harrisburg, even though technically on paper, the Franklin Railroad's an independent company. But the profits of the CVRR start reaching the ears of the financiers in Harrisburg. And in particular, the Pennsylvania Railroad starts seeing a lucrative opportunity to start investing in the Cumberland Valley. And they're going to very quietly start buying stock. They do not have enough to control the railroad but they certainly now have enough that they have influence over what the railroad's going to do. 
That's going to prove, that partnership's going to prove valuable during the war when the Pennsylvania Railroad will often lend equipment to the Cumberland Valley Railroad for operations. So because the PRR is involved, look at this beast. 1857, the Pennsylvania Railroad builds this. This is a massive depot right about the site of today's Amtrak station in, uh, Philadelphia, or in downtown Harrisburg. But you have four different railroads that came in here. You had the Pennsylvania Railroad, you had the Northern Central, you had the Cumberland Valley Railroad, and you had the Lebanon Valley Railroad. Uh, so you've got all these trains coming in here, uh, and they're all meeting at this one massive train station. So I'm going to turn it over to Cooper, uh, and Cooper's going to give you the Civil War, uh, what happens to this railroad. I want to give you the pre-war history because I want you to understand how important this railroad was to the economy of South Central Pennsylvania. It's a railroad, like I said, most of us have never heard of, but this railroad, as the war progresses, is going to make national headlines multiple times. So I'll turn it over to Cooper. So everybody here knows who John Brown is, right? And you know he didn't always look like this. He didn't always have the long white beard. Um, he had, he's a famous abolitionist by this point in 1859, um, famous because of, in 1856, he had murdered several pro-slavery settlers in Kansas massacre style, or execution style, excuse me. And Brown has, for the past three years by this time, has been plotting a new plan, this idea of uh, starting a big insurrection in Harper's Ferry. He even has plans for his own country. He actually writes his own constitution, of which he, of course, is by default the president of this new republic he's going to create. Um, but he, he chooses Chambersburg as the kind of uh, command center of his operation. And that's in large part because of the presence of the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Um, he and his associates actually board in the boarding house of Mary Rittner. Has anybody ever been there? It's uh, in downtown Chambersburg. It's actually operated by the Franklin County Historical Site. Uh, this is the, the boarding house uh, where he and his compatriots are coming and going all throughout the summer of 1859. Um, what I love about John Brown is, is if you've studied him at all, you know that he is more of a visionary rather than a planner. He would never get a job as a party planner because he was not good with details. So for instance, he has an alias. He calls himself Dr. Isaac Smith, but there's one part of the, the alias um, you know, jig that he doesn't really get, and that is that you have to be consistent. So he tells some people, he says, oh yeah, I'm a mining prospector. He tells other people, uh, oh, I'm a farmer. Uh, but he, he's a little bit you know, loosey-goosey. He arouses some suspicion, but not enough to really trigger anything. Um, so Brown is coming and going from Chambersburg throughout uh, 1859. He's bringing supplies in for his raid on the Cumberland Valley Railroad, storing them in warehouses. He and his associates are buying tickets. They're going to and fro. Um, and then finally, in October, on October 16th, 1859, they launch their raid. I think most people know how it goes. It's a complete uh, cataclysmic disaster from the very get-go. Uh, Brown is hung in December 1859 along with many of his co-conspirators. Um, and interestingly enough, the Cumberland Valley Railroad also figures prominently in the pursuit of two of Brown's um, associates. Uh, a man named Albert Hazlitt was uh, chased. He was actually found along the tracks of the Cumberland Valley Railroad. He was walking along them. Probably not the best way to get out. Uh, and, and a lot of these associates then are brought back along the Cumberland Valley Railroad to Chambersburg, where they're then transported south for trial and later execution. Um, but after Brown's raid, and we have the, the election of 1860 and the, the uh, ascendancy of Abraham Lincoln to the White House. And this triggers, of course, the secession crisis. Uh, I think because I'm speaking to a Civil War roundtable, I don't need to go into detail about what happens. But needless to say, over the coming weeks and months, uh, a slew of southern states will secede from the Union. Uh, and during this, the Cumberland Valley Railroad and its uh, leadership are not remaining idle. Um, Frederick Watts, um, who Scott mentioned, he is the, the leader, the, the spirit of the Cumberland Valley Railroad. He is, at this point, a very moderate individual. Um, there's a town meeting in Carlisle. They called them union meetings. There were these types of union meetings all across the north in January and February 1861, what historians call the secession winter. And Watts is at this meeting with his son. And Frederick Watts is a moderate, um, he's what we would call a unionist. Um, he actually, back in 1836, as he was just getting the Cumberland Valley Railroad, you know, the ball rolling, um, there had been an abolitionist preacher who had come to preach in Carlisle. And Watts was a signatory on a letter saying, don't do this. Don't talk about abolition. You're just going to disturb our southern neighbors. You're going to disturb our colleagues and our business partners. Go away. We don't want your type of agitation. 
And all the way in 1861, Watts feels the same way. He, um, he believes that a spirit of compromise, if cooler heads prevail, the war itself will be averted. How did that work out? Now, he actually, in this, this January 1861 meeting, comes out in support of the Crittenden Compromise, and that was a 13th Amendment before the 13th Amendment we know today, a proposed 13th Amendment. And what it proposed to do was to permanently protect slavery in all the states where it existed, which is unconstitutional. You can't make a constitutional amendment that can never be amended. Watts' son, at the very same meeting, opposes his father publicly and says, no, this is a war that needs to happen. Um, and in fact, Watts um, will become an enthusiastic supporter of the war uh, just a few months later in April 1861 when the first shots ring out at Fort Sumter. Watts is among the first um, to come out and express his enthusiastic support for the war effort. And this is important uh, because the Cumberland Valley Railroad, as we're going to see, is going to figure um, imp importantly in four successive years of military operations um, in southern Pennsylvania and northern or uh, western Maryland and northern Virginia. Um, now, as Scott has pointed out, this was a railroad. W do you think the Cumberland Valley Railroad was designed by Frederick Watts with a view of transporting dozens of regiments? This is a, a railroad that is meant to serve a very rural community in, south, in uh, Cumberland Valley, south central Pennsylvania. Um, at the time of the Civil War, uh, the Cumberland Valley Railroad has 12 locomotives, eight passenger cars, four baggage mail and express cars, and 79 freight cars. This is not the kind of railroad that you would expect to be transporting armies, yet in, sh in short time they will. Um, but still, it's important that men like Watts, who are leading the Cumberland Valley Railroad, come out in support of the Northern War effort, as we'll see. Because it doesn't take long for the railroad to begun, begin transporting troops to and from Camp Curtin, which is uh, the, the, what eventually becomes the largest Civil War training camp in the north. It's located just on the northern outskirts of Harrisburg. Um, during the course of the war, over 300,000 soldiers from Pennsylvania and other northern states will be trained there. And the Cumberland Valley Railroad is both picking up recruits from the Cumberland Valley, transporting them to Harrisburg, and as we will see very shortly, it will also transport those troops down the Cumberland Valley uh, to what may be the fields of battle, as far as they know. So the first uh, campaign, per se, that the Cumberland Valley Railroad becomes involved with uh, starts in late May, early June, 1861. And there's a fellow named Thomas Jonathan Jackson. You might know him as Stonewall Jackson. He doesn't become Stonewall Jackson until a month later at First Manassas. But in this, at this point, um, he, uh, he marches north and he seizes Harper's Ferry, which is still then part of uh, Virginia. It also means that the Confederates are precariously close to the, the Cumberland Valley Railroad's southern terminus in Harrisburg, or in ha Hagerstown, excuse me. And this alarms a lot of Pennsylvanians. So they marshal these forces under what's known as the Department of Pennsylvania, and they put this man, Robert Patterson in charge. How many people have heard of Robert Patterson? All right, obviously his reputation precedes him. So Robert Patterson, this is his campaign. He is a veteran of the War of 1812, which means he's young and spry come 1861. And he's leading this force down. He arrives in Chambersburg on the Cumberland Valley Railroad in a, in a rail car that is decked out to the T. He wants to make a very showy entrance. He wants people to know that he is General Robert Patterson. Pay attention to how he arrives, and we'll co contrast it with how he leaves. So Patterson's one job is he's here in Chambersburg. He commands a number of Pennsylvania regiments. They're to hold Joseph Johnston in the Shenandoah Valley. So Johnston's around Winchester. Um, Jackson, by this time, has actually retired from Harper's Ferry back to Winchester. Patterson is near Chambersburg. He has to hold Johnston in the valley because over here at Manassas Junction, there are forces under the... the um, Creole Confederate General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, the guy who used a lot of hair, uh, hair dye, was devastated when the blockade cut that supply off and his hair turned white, God forbid. Um, and he has another Confederate force at Manassas. And as many of you know, the first battle of Bull Run, first Manassas, Union troops are advancing down from Washington and attacking Beauregard's troops. So Patterson has just got to hold Johnston down so that he can't move over and reinforce Beauregard. Simple task. Does, does um, Patterson do it? No. Johnston is able to go use the Manassas Gap Railroad, get to Manassas Junction, and deliver the first major Confederate victory of the war. And of course, that journey also owns to earn Stonewall Jackson, his nickname as Stonewall Jackson. So Patterson, he leaves Chambersburg in an unmarked rail car. He resigns his commission shortly thereafter. The war for Robert Patterson is over. 
Interestingly enough, he writes a memoir in 1866, which was, you know, it was confined to a very short experience in the Civil War, which is over by the middle of the summer of 1861. But don't feel bad for him. He goes back to managing his cotton mills. He's a very wealthy man. So the Robert Patterson's war, however, is over. So the next experience the Cumberland Valley Railroad has with a military campaign uh, is in the fall of 1862, the Antietam Campaign. So as Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army is advancing northward, um, they have outpaced the Union Army. They've crossed the Potomac River. George McClellan, um, fast as usual, is, is just speeding on their pursuit. Uh, McClellan is moving up through Maryland. Uh, but in the meantime, there is a lot of concern and very um, understandable from Pennsylvania officials that this Confederate column is headed straight for Pennsylvania and that um, unretarded that they're going to uh, make a beeline into the Commonwealth. So they decide to organize a militia force. Pennsylvania had a pre-war militia force. Note the emphasis on had. Uh, on paper, Pennsylvania had 20 divisions of militia in 1861. That's pretty good, right? But these militia units, these are companies that are organized on the town level. So, the, for instance, Belfont, Pennsylvania had the Belfont Fencibles. It was a company of militia. They would meet about once every two months. They'd uh, look at a tree. They'd, they'd take some, uh, some uh, shots at it. And then they'd go to a pub. They'd have a few toasts, which would grow increasingly less coherent. And then they would just uh, get drunk. That was the militia. So it's not like a lean, mean fighting machine. But what happens when the war breaks out in April 1861? Most of these militia companies enlist after, under Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers. So when the Confederates are coming into Pennsylvania, there's no organized militia system to receive them. So they're scrambling last minute, throwing together hodgepodge regiments. They're getting last minute recruits, um, people who are literally coming from their jobs as clerks, as farmers, uh, and being kind of um, huddled into the ranks. So it's a very disorganized system, but they find a, an experienced general to head this new force, John Fulton Reynolds. I think he's probably pretty recognizable to most people in this room. Um, he's killed on, on July 1st at Gettysburg. Now, Reynolds is uh, pulled away from the Army of the Potomac, the main Union Army in Virginia. He commands the Pennsylvania Reserves, and he's not happy about it. He doesn't really like the militia. He kind of looks down on them. He's a career soldier. Um, and He's not too optimistic about this. And here's one of the things I love. Um, this is a letter he writes to his sister on September 14th. This is after he's gotten to Harrisburg. He's starting to organize the militia um, to repel the invasion. There's nothing in the Cumberland Valley to stop them, the Confederates, and our army is too far behind them to retru retard and overtake theirs if they push on boldly. You are not alarmed, I see, in Lancaster. That is all right. Do not allow yourselves to become so. Burn this up and do not let anyone see it. Clearly, she got that message, doesn't, didn't she? Burn this up. That's one of my favorite things in archives, when I get a letter that says, um, burn this after reading, and I'm thinking, I'm reading this 150 years later. You clearly did not burn this. Um, but Reynolds is not very optimistic about the, the chances the militia have to repel this invasion. Um, but what, wh where the Cumberland Valley Railroad comes into play is this is a, a un, an unprecedented, this place is unprecedented stress on the Cumberland Valley Railroad. It is, in fact, a logistical nightmare to transport. There's, there's a total of 25 regiments that are um, hastily assembled within a matter of two or three weeks. And the, the task that officials in Harrisburg have is putting all of these regiments on this little railroad that's designed for a rural country valley and assembling them near the border at Chambersburg. And in fact, they do a pretty good job. In fact, they're able to transport um, over a dozen of these regiments down to the Chambersburg area um, within a matter of about a week, week and a half, which is pretty impressive. Um, and Reynolds is there to assume command. Um, ultimately, I think most of you know the Battle of Antietam uh, is a Union victory and the Confederates are turned back into Virginia so that these militia troops never become engaged in active combat. However, what's important is they do demonstrate to Robert E. Lee, as we're going to see in just a moment, the potential of the Cumberland Valley Railroad to help um, streamline the Union war effort, to help um, hustle troops down the valley in a very quick and efficient manner. But as Scott mentioned, the Cumberland Valley Railroad is not something that is at the periphery of people's minds. In fact, it's running straight through the towns of the Cumberland Valley. You can't avoid the war. Um, you, there's no way. It, it, it's, it's, it's brought right to you. In fact, there's a letter from a man in Carlisle we found, and he talks about where do the tracks run in Carlisle, Scott mentioned, right down the center of High Street. 
High Street is a two-lane two road. So if you live on High Street, you're going to hear it. And in fact, there's a man named Jacob Bretz in Carlisle, and he says that all night long, all we heard was, were these cars and militiamen passing by, screaming and hallowing um, as they pass by. And, and it was just, it disrupts local life. And I think that's something that we often forget about. This is just tr transforming local communities. And a lot of the soldiers remembered their ride down the Cumberland Valley very fondly. Um, Louis Richard, the private in the 2nd Pennsylvania Militia in Reading, Pennsylvania, recalls that as they passed by Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, we were also greeted from the houses and roadsides all along the line by people waving their handkerchiefs and swinging their hats. At Mechanicsburg, a whole girls' school came out to see us. This was an especially engaging sight to some of our number who thought that, that village would be a good place to camp. <laughs> that is actually Irving Female College, which still stands today in the outskirts of Mechanicsburg. And indeed, the tracks run just yards away from it. So the Battle of Antietam is over. Um, the militia have proven of no use, not their own fault, just because the, the, the success of, of George McClellan's army. But George McClellan realizes that he's out of long-range uh, artillery ammunition, and he needs more. And McClellan is actually, shockingly enough, he's considering pursuing Robert E. Lee in, a, in an efficient manner. But in order to do this, he wants more long-range artillery ammunition. This is actually one of Scott's famous or favorite episodes of the book. He has uh, named this the Amazing Am Antietam Ammunition Run. So McClellan telegraphs Washington. He needs more of this ammunition. And in a, a remarkable feat, they load the ammunition on cars, send them up the, Balt the um, Northern Central Railroad um, to Harrisburg. And from Harrisburg, they'll take them down the Cumberland Valley Railroad, down the Cumberland Valley, through Chambersburg, all the way to Hagerstown and bring them to McClellan's army, which is still um, on the Antietam battlefield. It's a remarkable feat. They accomplished this in four hours and 31 minutes. The trains average a speed of over 37 miles per hour. In fact, at times, the train eclipsed a speed of over 50 miles per hour, unheard of in those days. However, there's a couple problems that make this particularly precarious. What's on the cars? Ammunition. As the cars are going at these really fast speeds, there's something called journal boxes near the axles. They're, heat, they're filled with oil-soaked rags, and they're heating up, and they're catching on fire. These are cars filled with ammunition going through the centers of downtown Carlisle, Mechanicsburg, Shippensburg, Chambersburg, Greencastle, and they're worried, well, what if the car catches on fire and explodes? This could be catastrophic. So they actually have to stop at, for two 10-minute intervals to let the the fires start to qu uh, quell before they can continue on. So it's a very hazardous journey. But once again, it, so it d demonstrates just how useful the Cumberland Valley Railroad, how important it can be to the Union war effort. Does McClellan use them? Nope. Shockingly, George McClellan, who has a reputation for being a little overly cautious, decides not to pursue Robert E. Lee. So it's an amazing feat, but once again, it goes for naught. So after this, um, about, uh, about a week and a half after the Battle of Antietam, tragedy strikes the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Um, as many of you know, this is actually the third book on railroads that Scott has written. This is kind of the third piece of his trilogy of Civil War railroads in Pennsylvania. And the two other railroads he's written on had very bad safety records. The Cumberland Valley Railroad, by contrast, actually has a very sterling safety record. Um, this is kind of the, the big blemish on their, on their record is what happens in late September 1862. So those militia re regiments that I mentioned that have traveled down the railroad on the Cumberland Valley Railroad, as Robert E. Lee has retreated back to Virginia, they're now being sent home. And it's actually a, a regiment that is raised in Philadelphia and Reading, the 20th Pennsylvania Militia, and they are on their way home up the Cumberland Valley, and as they're approaching Bridgeport, modern-day Lemoyne, just across the river from Harrisburg, they uh, collide with this small little engine, that one Scott told you about earlier called the Utility. It's 7.30 in the morning, there's dense fog um, concealing it, and it's a horrific accident. Um, the cars basically just pile up. Um, there are about 30 men who are just maimed and killed. Um, there's even the, 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 the blast, if you want to call it that, can be heard, the collision can be heard from miles away. Uh, it, it is really just a horrific incident. Uh, in the Cumberland Valley Railroad's history. In fact, Judge Watts and the Cumberland Valley Railroad Board will go around compensating victims' families, and even the state legislature will award one of the soldiers who was um, incapacitated for life uh, a pension, a state pension in 1865. 
So this is a, a real blemish on uh, a tragic incident on the, in the history of the Cumberland Valley Railway. So the Confederates are not gone yet. There's a, a, a Confederate uh, general, as Scott mentioned earlier, named Jeb Stewart, you may have heard of him, who leads a raid into Pennsylvania. So this is after Lee's army has retreated back into Virginia after Antietam. Robert E. Lee, however, knows that Jeb Stewart has a, has a flair for riding behind the Union lines, and he sends him on an expedition to go up into Pennsylvania to go to Chambersburg. Uh, he wants him to knock out the Cumberland Valley Railroad. He also wants him to burn the Cumberland Valley Railroad Bridge, which is just above this map, at a little town called Scotland. And he wants him, while he's there, to gather information, um, to, to pro possibly take a few political prisoners, to be ransomed off, and of course, just to you know, scare the living daylights out of the Yankees. That's the goal of this mission. And Stewart, of course, is uh, more than happy to comply. He leaves on October 9th. Um, he reaches Chambersburg. And when he reaches Chambersburg, he, before his men go about destroying the Cumberland Valley Railroad, he starts to inquire to local citizens about that railroad bridge up in Scotland, the same railroad bridge that had transported dozens of regiments of Pennsylvania militia just a few weeks earlier. And the residents in Chambersburg, they say, oh, you don't want to burn that bridge. You can't. It's made of steel. We'll see about that. But anyway, Stuart makes good work of Chambersburg itself. Um, these are, this is a Harper's Weekly illustration. Here are his men going through U.S. government warehouses. They're, of course, pruning uh, the supplies, taking what they want, um, some new jackets, some new revolvers, and then, of course, they set it on fire. And they, they do good work, or good work in, in quotation marks, on the Cumberland Valley Railroad itself. Uh, it is thoroughly destroyed within Chambersburg. But notably, they do not get to that railroad bridge north of town. So if, if you're the Cumberland Valley Railroad, 1862 has been a rough year. You've been through some, some economic struggles before, but you've never had an invading army come and attack your railroad uh, so virulently. So if you're on the board of the Cumberland Valley Railroad, which meets later in October 1862, you're going to have a long board meeting, but do you rebuild? What do you think? <laughs> All right, they do rebuild. Wrong answer. 1863, we have more Confederates coming as part of the Gettysburg campaign. And the Confederate advance is spearheaded by this man, Albert Gallatin Jenkins. And Jenkins is a cavalry commander. Um, he is leading the Confederate advance as they, as they move into Pennsylvania. And as a, as a, um, as consequently, he is also inflicting most of the damage on the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Um, so as they're going through um, past Chambersburg, Jenkins proves that that bridge in Scotland, it can be burned. It's made of wood. In fact, we use it on the cover of our book. Um, so Jenkins proves that it is indeed flammable. Uh, and he is, again, most of the destruction um, as he's going up the Cumberland Valley Railroad is inflicted by Jenkins' brigade. Um, he <coughs> enters Mechanicsburg, a small town, which I'll go back to the map here. Small town right here, just west of Harrisburg. He enters on June 28th. This is actually one of the, the little dining rooms along the railroad. Um, and I was told by a local historian in Mechanicsburg, you should say dining rooms. It wasn't exactly a very exquisite place, a very rough and tumble place. <laughs> Um, a dining room along the Cumberland Valley Railroad where Jenkins will actually visit. Uh, and meanwhile, the Cumberland Valley Railroad is also being used um, a little bit less, a little bit more tentatively by the Union soldiers who are trying to defend the city. Um, this is actually a, a sketch by um, a member of the 22nd New York State National Guard. Once again, Pennsylvania has to raise a bunch of militia hastily to defend Harrisburg. They also bring in some New York National Guard uh, <laughs> troops. The New York National Guard are camped under the Cumberland Valley Railroad Bridge here. And this is actually later, um, this is a depiction of the 1863 campaign by Courier and Ives, the famous lithograph firm. They later put out a, a print in 1865 called Cumberland Valley, and you can see the Cumberland Valley Railroad in the distance. So meanwhile, while Jenkins is continuing up the valley, you have other Confederates, as Scott alluded to earlier, who are doing uh, or, or destroying the railroad in other places. Robert Rhodes in Carlisle, famous for his attack on Oak Hill at Gettysburg, he's destroying the railroad bridges in Carlisle. George Pickett, our friend who led a little charge two days later, on July 1st, he's in Chambersburg. He's destroying the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Now, the Confederates, I don't need to summarize this for you, but the Battle of Gettysburg ends in a Confederate defeat. The Confederates leave Pennsylvania, and the task of rebuilding the railroad um, is upon the Union war effort. And 
Leading it is Herman Haupt. Uh, he is part of the U.S. Military Railroad. He's spearheading this effort to rebuild the railroad. Now, he'll devote most of his efforts to York and Adams counties, but he does come over to the Cumberland Valley uh, on several occasions. And in fact, there is somebody in Washington, D.C. who's monitoring the rebuilding efforts of the Cumberland Valley Railroad really closely. That's Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln does not want Robert E. Lee to escape uh, again. So he's trying to get enough of these Union militia troops who have again massed in Harrisburg to ride the Cumberland Valley Railroad down and cut Robert E. Lee off. The problem is that as the Confederates were advancing, they were destroying the railroad. So by July 3rd, the railroad is repaired to Carlisle. By July 13th, it's repaired to about Shippensburg. So as it's slowly getting repaired, Abraham Lincoln is not happy. He writes a letter or a telegraph, excuse me, to one of his commanders in Harrisburg, and he, he one of the best lines of Abraham Lincoln's presidency, he says, um, at the current pace you're going, you are more likely to capture the man in the moon than any part of Lee's army. <laughs> and of course, th this, this, um, this commander that he's writing to, he, he has no response. He just says, it's slow business building the railroad. And you know, Lincoln is not happy with that. So Lincoln is just furious at this. Oops, so. Okay, 1863 is over, July. Uh, by the end of July, the railroad is mostly operational. So, if you are on the board of the Cumberland Valley Railroad, you go to your board meeting, October 1863, do you rebuild? What do you think? All right, well, they're, they're a little more keen than you guys. They say no. They say, we're waiting this thing out. We are not going through that again. So they say, no, we're not rebuilding in 1864. I think that proved to be a pretty smart decision because in 1864 we have the appearance of another Confederate uh, force. This one is commanded by um, John McCausland, often known as Tiger John. Um, he leads a brigade of just under 3,000 Confederate cavalrymen north uh, in uh, late July 1864. They arrive in Chambersburg and they demand a ransom. It's uh, either $100,000 in gold or $500,000 in cash. Now, the citizens of Chambersburg, there's no Union troops in Chambersburg. There are actually some a few miles away, which is very controversial after the fact. And, you know, citizens of Chambersburg are a little cavalier about this. You're going to burn a town defenseless with women and children? Yeah, right. Well, when the, when the flames start, their uh, fears are uh, a little bit more, uh, they, they give the situation a little bit more uh, of a serious nature. Uh, and, in fact, much of the town will burn. Uh, 500 buildings in total burn, 278 of them private residences. Remarkably, there's only one civilian casualty. And the, da the, danger, the, the, excuse me, the damage to Chambersburg itself is enormous. This is a, a picture right after the event. Um, but because the Cumberland Valley Railroad decided not to rebuild, the railroad emerges largely unscathed. So it proved to be a really, really uh, good decision. And in fact, um, there are, there's a lot of damage to, to the employee, the homes of employees of the Cumberland Valley Railroad, but the railroad itself um, suffers little damage uh, in, in the flames. And in fact, the railroad will be crucial to transporting refugees from the site of the fire to Harrisburg, uh, and also to bringing supplies in to rebuild the city from Harrisburg, um, really speeding up the recovery process for Chambersburg. So finally, 1865, the war is winding to a close, and the, the officials of the Cumberland Valley Railroad can feel it. They're really excited for, to undertake a massive rebuilding project. And in fact, the Cumberland Valley Railroad will be raking in a lot of money in 1865 as veterans return home. The number of passengers on the railroad spikes dramatically in April 1865, July 1865, and November 1865 as these veterans are boarding the railroad making their way home. Uh, and in fact, in the, from 1866 to 1872, the railroad will give itself a massive facelift. Uh, if, you had looked, if you had visited the Cumberland Valley and traveled along the railroad in 1861 and done that, made that same journey uh, 11 years later in 1872, you would recognize virtually nothing. Um, it is just a complete rebuild. Has anybody ever been to Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania? All right, have you ever seen this building here, Mechanicsburg Museum? This is one of these post-war uh, features of the Cumberland Valley Railroad. It's a lot nicer than what was there before when Albert Jenkins was there. Um, they're building new depots, uh, new warehouses. They're really revitalizing the Cumberland Valley Railroad uh, during this post-war period. So with that, I want to thank you very much for having us tonight and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.